Good morning. We're going to be talking about Jesus, Martha, and Mary this morning in, uh, in John 11, if you want to open up there. In verse, um, I'll pick up in verse 21, uh, and then I'm going to jump down to, to 25. So in uh, John chapter 11, verse uh, 20, uh, 21, Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then in verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, uh, I'm sorry, he who believes in me, will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And then in verse 27, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. So, you know, even uh, despite the faith of both Martha and Mary, uh, and we recognize that uh, Bethany is just a little bit out of um, Jerusalem, a few miles. Uh, they, they certainly went through a lot of grief and a lot of confusion over Jesus' absence uh, during their brother's illness and then eventual death. And their reaction here that we're going to go over brings out a really a common human tendency that, uh, that we, we equate a physical presence with care and personal involvement. That uh, if, if, you're, if you're physically present with someone, it goes a lot more to um, enhancing our belief that they really care. Uh, and there are some instances, obviously, that you can't necessarily be right there present. But if it's uh, like in this case, Martha and Mary, they gave him several days notice that Lazarus was sick. And here, uh, you know, they're waiting for him to show up. And for four days, he doesn't show up. And in that, that four days, Lazarus has died. So they believe that if Jesus had been physically present, then Lazarus would not have died. So their faith here was mingled with a little bit of doubt. The sister's message for Jesus to come and heal Lazarus shows their faith. They had faith in him and his power uh, and his compassion. All right. So, but their statement, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It reveals a misunderstanding, really, of Jesus' ability. Uh, and it, but Jesus' delay was not because of indifference on his part. It was intended to strengthen the faith and reveal his glory through the resurrection of Lazarus, proving his mastery over life and death. And we'll get into a little bit more of that. But Martha's interaction with Jesus when he arrived shows a faith that was growing. You know, it, it wasn't quite where Jesus wanted it to be, and we're going to see that uh, in, in a moment here. So this acknowledgment... You know, she expressed uh, belief in Jesus' immediate power and his role in the eventual resurrection, you know, at the end of times. So she believed that much. And this acknowledgement shows her kind of grappling just a little bit with the, the mortal, you know, as well as the eternal implications of her faith. She recognized that Jesus would would you know resurrect uh, on that on that final day but she wasn't so sure about um in the interim you know what what could jesus have done uh, he wasn't there so uh it seems as though that opportunity window in her mind was gone she wasn't going to see her brother until the resurrection so uh, Jesus responded, and he did not minimize, you know, the, the significance of, of his physical presence, but by elevating Martha's understanding just a little bit, stating to her, I, I am the resurrection and life, in verse 25. 
So this statement by Jesus was meant to kind of elevate um, or shift her focus from the physical expectation uh, to the eternal truths that he was trying to get through to her, reassuring her that belief in him uh, extended beyond the physical death, that it was that it, it, it was more than just him that Lazarus dying physically, emphasizing that his spiritual presence brings continuous access to the divine power regardless of whether he was physically there or not. Uh, and w you know we saw that that faith earlier on. Uh, with the, uh, the nobleman's son, you know, just say the word from across town uh, and, and, and you could heal my son. So uh, he's, Jesus is trying to help uh, Martha and Mary uh, here to recognize that he didn't have to be there physically. He could have done it from a distance. But in her mind, if he had a, if he'd have been there, then her brother wouldn't have died. So she was still stuck in this, this idea that, that his physical presence uh, was what was necessary. So the account of Lazarus is really an emotional lesson for us on the ways uh, God purposes, you know, his purposes might differ just a little bit from what uh, our human expectations might be. You know, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't want to put God in a box that says he's got to respond the way I want. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it isn't what I expect, so uh, God's not working. So uh, it also highlights several of the key issues that we're going to be dealing with here. So the <laughs> events here in Bethany teach that, that God's plans, including the timing of his actions, aren't always... Um, what we think, and, but they're always aimed at a higher good, such as, in this case, strengthening the, the faith of both Martha and Mary, and demonstrating his power over a wide audience, including his skeptics, because there was a lot of people there that we'll see a little bit later in the scriptures here, uh, that didn't believe in him, and actually took offense uh, that, um, uh, that he would lay, raise Lazarus and then go and conspire with the Pharisees. But Jesus' actions here show that faith isn't just about believing in what God can do, but trusting in what he chooses to do. And that's an interesting statement. We have to be able to trust in what God chooses to do and conversely, what he chooses not to do. So this includes believing in his presence in our lives and his goodwill. We know that he has goodwill. And when physical evidence suggests otherwise, when we don't necessarily get the response that we want, we think that, well, God doesn't care. He's got other things. He's got world issues to go, to go deal with. How can he deal with my issue, right? Uh, you know, he's got conflicts throughout, wars raging that are a lot more important than us individually, right? Hmm? No, not necessarily. Uh, we'll talk about that. So the raising of Lazarus served to reveal Christ not only as a helper, but also the very source of life itself. So helping people to see beyond the immediate circumstances to the eternal life that he offers. And that's what he's suggesting here to Martha. So um, I want to, um, I want to uh, jump down to verse 28. He says, When he had said this, she, Martha, went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, The teacher is here and is calling for you. You ever thought about that verse? That verse really sums up the essence of Christ's message here on this earth. The teacher is here and he's calling for you. Jesus' arrival here in Bethany marks a key moment, not just historically, but spiritually as well. The teacher is here and he's calling for you. So his ministry here on earth 
and his ongoing presence, even today, signifies a continuing invitation to all of humanity. The teacher's here, and he's calling. So what are the purposes of his call? What's, what, you know, what are the main uh, purposes that he, uh, that he calls us? Well, first, calls us to salvation. Real important, obviously. Jesus calls us to a life that is freed from the bondage of sin and its consequences. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's one of the first purposes. And the call also is to offer sympathy. Just as he comforted Martha and Mary in their distress, he is called is, you know, it extends sympathy uh, to all who mourn and suffer, offering divine comfort. In Matthew 5, 4, it says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Not, not just some, but uh, that's to those with the faith that recognize that Jesus is trying to comfort us, that there isn't, uh, that a physical death is not the end. If, if it comes to death, okay? And then also, his call is for our service. Calls us to follow in him, engage in the, um, in the work that he started, whether it's leading in the front or serving quietly in the background. We are all called to serve. So what are the characteristics of his call? You know, unlike human invitations, when we get an invitation to something, uh, that might be offered out of courtesy uh, or sometimes an expectation of a reward. Uh, you know, that um, uh, they're going to get something uh, if you accept an invitation because there's a reciprocal okay, uh, effect, you know, that, they, that they're going to get something. But Christ isn't like that. Uh, his call is genuine and it's heartfelt uh, and uh, we're not going to there's no way to repay him so he's not expecting a repayment uh, there's not a favor that he is trying to uh, extend that he wants one back uh, it is out of his genuine love for us and his invitation really carries a weight of a command uh, when you go to the um, uh, the great commission uh, it is, uh, it's a demanding a response. That's part of his invitation to become part of hmm, in the movement, if you will, uh, part of his kingdom, part of uh, the work that he wants us to be involved in. So responding to Jesus, his call also brings ultimate blessings to us. You know, it's like, the, um, like a prisoner set free. Uh, Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. And it's also a, uh, the results of that is a call to a banquet, similar to the, uh, the uh, precursor, if you will, uh, in a sense, uh, the Lord's table. Now, a wedding banquet is a lot different than a remembrance from a, uh, uh, of a sacrifice. Uh, but that call that we are called for, is, it is also a call for an eventual, a wedding banquet, the wedding of the bride and the groom. Um, we're inv uh, invited to partake in that, that spiritual, eternal feast with Christ, and that's in Luke 14. But it's also uh, the results of the, um, uh, an eternal fellowship that we share. Answering his call means entering into a lifelong communion. You know, as, as Steve brought up a little while ago, we don't come as a group, but we, but we end up as a group. Uh, uh, in 1 John 1, 3, John says, What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So uh, there's a lots of benefits to answering that call. Uh, the teacher is here and is calling for you. All right, so let's uh, move on down to uh, uh, pick up in verse 32. 
Therefore, when Mary, okay, remember Martha went to get Mary. When Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. <coughs> you know, this kind of reflects a human condition that we have. A desire for Christ's physical presence in, in times of our need. You know, <clears throat> faith beyond sight. Some may say, if you were here, Lord, I would have believed. As though we need um, something physical, something, uh, something to see. Yet true faith is often characterized by belief in the unseen. And uh, we know that in uh, Jesus' confrontation or discussion with uh, Thomas after his resurrection, uh, Jesus said, blessed are those who believe without seeing. So faith that endures, uh, despite you know, Jesus not being physically present, uh, is the faith that truly understands his eternal nature and his kingdom. We don't need uh, to physically see Jesus. You know, it's like uh, people might say, well, you know what, if, the, um, if I could see a miracle, then I would believe. Well, we, we have ample proof, evidence, that miracles don't necessarily relate to uh, faith uh, and belief. Uh, the um, uh, obviously, the miracles of the destruction of Egypt didn't necessarily uh, instill a huge amount of faith in the, uh, 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 in the uh, sons of Abraham coming out of Egypt. Okay, also, uh, how about strength in our temptations? If you were here, Lord, I could resist temptation. But the scriptures really say that Christ's spirit and his word is what provides us with all the strength we need to overcome any trial. Ephesians 6, uh, 10 through 17, we're familiar with that. Putting on the full armor of God. That's how we resist temptation. So, And then Peter's denial of Christ. Even though Christ was present when he denied him uh, you know, at, at his trial and, and his uh, scourging, that didn't help him uh, resist temptation. But later, Peter's boldness in Acts uh, chapter um, 4, it's evident that Christ's presence wasn't necessary for him to be bold. In verse 13 of Acts 4, Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. So here you've got Peter at the very beginning with Christ's presence who denied him. But then later on, after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, he didn't need Jesus' presence to be bold uh, and to be able to speak out. So just by uh, our, our temptation, we don't, we don't need Jesus' physical presence to be able to resist temptation. Or how about comfort in sorrow? There are those that might say, well, if you were here, Lord, this pain would be bearable. Well, while Christ's presence was uh, uh, definitely comforting to Martha and Mary, his spiritual presence really offers a deeper peace that can change any suffering into a blessing. In Romans 8, 28, it says, God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. So we're assured of his presence, especially in our tough trials. We don't, we don't, ne we don't need Jesus' presence um, to, uh, to have uh, that comfort in times of sorrow. Or how about courage in persecution? If you were here, I would face persecution bravely. Courage to 
you know, face persecution doesn't come from Christ's physical presence or his closeness, but from a secure union with him in spirit. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. God has given us that, uh, that gift of power. We, don't, we, don't, we can face that persecution without Christ being here present. So those who suffer, especially for Christ, are in essence really suffering with him and drawing strength from his spirit. Uh, Philippians 3.10, that uh, Paul speaking to the Philippians, he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being confer- conformed to his death. And how about the success in our ministry? If you were only here, Lord, my efforts in your work would succeed. Hmm. You know, the early church's explosive growth right after uh, in the first century highlights really Christ's physical presence uh, or his absence didn't hinder the growth of the church. It exploded without his physical presence. So the real challenge is often our own lack of faith in the promises that he's given to us where he says, I am always with you even to the end of the age. He'll always be with us. So our mission, success, it doesn't uh, hinge on visible signs, uh, but on the steady faith and power in the Holy Spirit. That's where our faith has to be. And it's crucial to recognize that Christ is always present with us through his spirit. His nearness should empower us to be able to tackle um, all the difficult uh, difficulties around us, to be able to withstand temptation, endure the trials, and face lo- uh, losses in our life uh, with, with strong encouragement that, that Christ is still with us. So we've got to be able to hold fast to the assurance of his constant presence in our life. And then uh, the last verse that I want to touch on Verse 35, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible, obviously, but it speaks volumes about the depth of Jesus' humanity and his compassion. You know, Steve did a lesson a few, uh, uh, several Sundays ago about uh, showing that through scriptures we can know God. How can we know God through this particular passage? The shortest passage Shortest verse in the scripture, Jesus wept. What does that tell us about God? There was three distinct times that we know of that Jesus wept in the scripture. One of them was over Jerusalem's impending destruction, and here at Lazarus's tomb, and then also in the Garden of Gethsemane before uh, his um, uh, uh, death. So what was the nature of Christ's tears? We know that Christ accepted fully human emotions and confirming the, the truth in the Bible. of You know, in Job 5, 7, it says that man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. Man is born to trouble as nearly as sparks fly upward, as surely as sparks fly upward. It's like... Sparks don't ever, they don't ever go downward. <laughs> they always fly upward. And, and, and the scripture says, Job says through the scriptures that um, we're born to trouble just like that. Uh, just as surely as sparks fly upward. So, you know, known as the, uh, in Isaiah 53, as the man of sorrows, Jesus' capacity to weep underscores his, his total connection with our human experience. So, you know, most of the time that when we shed tears, uh, they're usually for our own benefit, but Jesus' tears here were not for his own benefit, but they were for others, whether it be for friends or for an entire city that was about to be destroyed. His empathy was 
was an expression of the love that he carried for all of humanity, individually and as a whole. But as I mentioned a moment ago, that we can know God through the scriptures, Jesus' tears also reflect the heart of God. You know, far from being indifferent, God is deeply moved by human suffering. When we consider that, that, that God, you know, in heaven, on his throne, um, we think that he is so far removed from us that how could he possibly know or care about us individually? But when it says here in the scripture that Jesus wept, God has the same emotions as what Jesus did. They're, they're the same. So when we are in sorrow, when we're going through difficult times, can you see God weeping? The scriptures state that God's compassionate nature, uh, in Psalm 103, verse 13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. So what were the reasons behind Jesus' tears? So at Lazarus' tomb here, Jesus mourned the loss of his friend, okay, showing that, showing that he really valued, um, you know, deep personal relationships, and he felt the sting of death just as we do. Jesus not only mourned Lazarus' death, but also shared in the grief of Martha and her sister, showing that, you know, for us, how to bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6, 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and therefore, therefore fulfill the law of Christ, bearing one another's burdens. His tears at Lazarus' tomb were probably not just only for a lost friend, but really for the universal tragedy of human mortality. You know, it didn't have to be that way, but sin entered the world, and that's where we get human mortality. Uh, but, you know, Jesus probably felt, felt several emotions at that time. But also, Christ's tears were not without a purpose. They led to an action on his part. After weeping, Jesus miraculously raised Lazarus, demonstrating his compassion that moved him to intervene in the suffering, sufferings of Martha and Mary and any of the other friends that were right there. This pattern sets an example for Christian empathy today, not just to feel, but to act, proving practical help and spiritual support for those that are in need. So what are the lessons from Christ's tears here? First off, compassion, okay? Christ's tears assures us of his shared feelings for our sufferings, our struggles, and that he's also not a distant deity, but a present help in times of good. Psalm 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, and a call to empathy on our part. We're taught to emulate his sympathy, to weep with those who weep, and taking part in the lives of those around us. So there, uh, you know, in these, in these passages here, uh, there's a lot of guidance for us, but it's also, I find that uh, in these scriptures here, helps bring out the same feelings that, that we feel, God feels. He weeps when we uh, struggle, when we, uh, when we are in sorrow, when we have losses, that he weeps too. Christ did. So God does, uh, and we have to recognize that he is always present with us. Uh, 
It may not, because we can't see him physically, we have to remember that he is with us spiritually. So let's close in prayer.